collaboration with the Cyprus Mail. This is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambus. This week, the emphasis is very much on the environment. We hear about a change in the law which, in effect, encourages poaching and illegal bird trapping. From today, basically, if somebody shoots up to 50 of these birds on the list, all he gets is a slap on the wrist and 200 euros. And in our seas, the fight continues against the invasive lionfish. We understand that this is a battle that is not easy to control because the lionfish is widely spread now. It has expanded in the Mediterranean. Environmentalists were outraged this week when the fines incurred for the illegal trapping and killing of birds was reduced from 2,000 euros to just 200. It's been called a shameful amendment to the law by BirdLife Cyprus, whose campaigns manager joins us now. Dasos Shalis, thank you very much indeed for spending time with us on the programme this week. Can you first of all outline why this amendment was made? Because it looks to most of us like simply MPs pandering to a very powerful lobby on the island rather than looking at what's good for the whole of Cyprus and Cypriots. In a nutshell, I think you have clearly pointed out to what exactly it is. Because from an environmental perspective, it makes no sense the reduction that has been passed by the majority of our MPs, uh, apart from the, the Greens, all the rest of the parties, they voted for this reduction, uh, which, as you've said, it has reduced the fines for protected species, uh, black caps, wobblers, uh, golden orioles, a made-up list, uh, basically, that is the target species for the illegal bird trappers and poachers uh, from 2,000 euros to 200 euros for up to 50 birds. It's important to say that. So from today, basically, if somebody shoots up to 50 of these birds on the list, all he gets is a slap on the wrist and 200 euros. Before the passing of this law, for even shooting one of those birds, it would have been 2,000 euros. So essentially... This law promotes and serves the traps and the poachers and promotes law-breaking. This is what it is, which is outrageous uh, for us, and that's how, why we have condemned it. We have been attending all the discussions in the, at the Parliament uh, during the discussions from the Environmental Committee. But really, this, this issue was not really discussed in detail, and, and the views of most of the MPs were for the reduction, essentially probably to, to win the votes for the next parliamentary elections. This is, this is how we would say it. Right. I'm a little bit confused about the method of killing these protected species because I think the fines are different depending on whether you shoot them, you use lime sticks or you use nets. Is that right? Uh, yes, essentially, yes. Um, it, it gets a bit complicated, but... Uh, in a nutshell, if you use a mist net, because the, they consider mist nets as a, it's a non-selective method, of course, but because they consider it as industrial killing, they've kept the fines up, up to uh, two or three thousand euros for the legal use of a mist net, or even of even catching one of these birds. But because the lime sticks, the MPs. The, a lot of the MPs, they consider them as still the traditional practice and they are feeding this story that has been going on forever. They have reduced that to the 200 euros uh, or the 400 euros that we said. It is 400 euros for the illegal use of lime sticks because essentially when somebody is using lime sticks and has birds on them, we are talking about two offences. One is for the illegal use of the lime sticks, 200 euros, and the other is for the illegal killing of up to 50 birds, 200 euros. So that's why the fine goes up to 400 euros if you are capturing these birds on lime sticks. Whereas with the gun, 
which is the extradited thing that was part of this outrageous amendment that has been passed. To use a gun, it's a legal means of killing game species. What is the illegal thing is to shoot those birds. And those and the illegal act of shooting these protected species is only 200 euros. Now, tell me about the role of the Game and Fauna Fund in this, because I had thought over the years that you cooperated very closely with them and that they were one of the organisations that was trying to put a stop to all this illegal poaching. We do cooperate on certain matters. Uh, illegal bear trapping and hunting is not one of our strong uh, agreements, I have to say. Uh, especially with the, regarding the, the lime sticks or the shooting of specific species. Uh, and sadly, this, this proposal was included uh, after most likely uh, we know from pressures from MPs was included in the overall law bill that was put for discussion in the Environment Committee because this, this was just a part of, of the bill that was put for discussion. It included some good stuff. But also it included this, the Game and Fauna Service in the discussions of the Environmental Committee never objected to this. They never queried it or questioned it or said this is non-applicable. And sadly, it was left to the, to, to the MPs, which are most of them um, pro-trapping, pro-hunting, and we had the result of passing the law, uh, which was, to us, it, it's been a, a big blow. It, it essentially... The other worst thing that could have happened to this was to make trapping legalized. This is the next step to what has happened by putting such low fines and the game service uh, not, not giving a fight and even including it in the bill that was discussed. It, it essentially takes us 20 years back of efforts on, on stopping this. Uh, it, it equates basically to what a few years back a well-known at that time MP was uh, putting pictures of, of, uh, of birds uh, when he was eating them in a table and, and was saying, soon in our table, uh, and it was about the black cubs, and he was fighting at that time a lot about reducing the fines or allowing it. Essentially, this is kind of an outcome of all that that was happening then. Uh, through, through this amendment. Now, I have also read in some of the coverage in the local press that the Game and Fauna Fund actually proposed the amendment, and I quote from the newspaper, reasoning that the previously steep fines were unenforceable and the now €200 Euro fine will be more effective. Well, if one fine is unenforceable, it doesn't really matter what the amount of the fine is, does it? They're all unenforceable. Exactly. I mean, uh, this was, these were arguments that were used by the game service during the discussions. And so we are, we are like, you, like you are saying, a logical person would wonder, okay, for the poaching that is 2,000 euros, you can enforce and issue the fine. But for the illegal bed trapping that actually from a conservation perspective should be higher up in the fines, you cannot enforce the 2,000 euros, and that's why you drop it 200 euros. I mean, the level of discussion regarding this matter in the Environment Committee, I have to admit, was ridiculous. I mean, the arguments we were hearing, not just the unenforceable bit or the not being effective, uh, if it's 2,000 or whatever, but also from the MPs, the level of arguments that we heard during the voting at the plenary, uh, we heard about traditional hunting should be allowed to some extent or that uh, these birds cause damages to bees uh, or in other countries this is allowed and this we have the highest fines in Europe. I mean, it's really disappointing to hear these things, you know, from people that we have voted uh, to represent and pass laws for the protection of the environment and all the other laws that they are passing. Where do we stand with Europe on this? Because this is going against all the directives that I'm aware of. Are we likely, because we've made it easier for this illegality to continue or even to perhaps increase, are we likely to get a slap on the wrist from Europe? I sure hope so, to be honest, because uh, it seems like we don't, we don't care about what we are passing 
in terms of that, we are chasing votes. If you ask me, since soon enough we're having a parliamentary elections, at least to my eyes. But, uh, yeah, I would hope the Commission would uh, give a strong, a strong signal to... In fact, the European Commission a few years back had told us you are not allowed, it's not permitted under the European law to have any derogation for selective methods. So it was a clear cut then. At that time, they were trying to say we will give a derogation for hunting these birds. But essentially, this is the next step after not being allowed is to reduce the fines so ridiculously that in practice you are decriminalizing these offenses. So I hope and I do expect that the Commission will will come strongly against the, against the Cyprus government for this. Can it be overturned? I mean, as we said at the beginning, and this I'm sure is what it's all about, elections are looming and it does seem that our MPs, most of them anyway, are much more interested in whether or not they'll get the votes of the hunting lobby. And we should add, for those who aren't familiar with the situation in Cyprus, that the hunting lobby is strong enough that it's even managed to persuade the government that hunters should be able to break the curfew, which is in place for the pandemic COVID-19 for everybody else on the island. It's extraordinary. Yes, it's it's extraordinary and it's unfair. And it really shows basically the dynamics of what we are facing. And really the public should start uh, realizing and hopefully we can have a change on this. Regarding whether the, the law can be turned around, it will be difficult. It's not impossible. I mean, we've had laws before, not not directly related to the bird protection law, but other laws that were passed. And the Commission had come in the past and said, this is not in line with the European directives. You need to change it. And that has happened. That was about na- nature protection um, laws. But it's, it will be difficult uh, because it would, it would still need to go through the, through the discussions from the Parliament to change what they have voted, you know, uh, and it's not that the people will change. I mean, to overturn this would mean a complete turnover of new people in the parliament with new minds that they really understand that they should be passing laws to protect the environment and not to serve the poachers and bear trappers. Uh, In that sense, if that happened, then I I could see a turn the next day of, of, of the voting. So it's really a question of who gets elected to the next parliament and for everybody who supports protecting our environment and, of course, our biodiversity here in Cyprus to make sure that the right people are sitting on those seats in parliament. Yeah, I mean, I mean things like these that they have just passed, these laws, they really make it even uh, stronger, the point that we really need to select carefully who we vote for because it can destroy efforts of conservation that environmental NGOs, they've been trying for 20 years since we joined the European Union. I mean, it's, it really shows the case of, you know, it makes a difference who gets voted in this. That is Tasso Chalice, campaign's coordinator for BirdLife Cyprus, talking about that shameful amendment to the law, and one has to wonder what our MPs are thinking about. Or perhaps we actually know what they're thinking about, and it certainly isn't the good of the Cypriot environment. Listen online to the Cyprus News Digest on YouTube or at cypressmail.libsyn.com. The latest program is uploaded every Friday, and if you missed one, you can catch up there. Regular listeners will know that several years ago now, I spoke to someone at the fisheries department about the proliferation of lionfish, particularly in the eastern Mediterranean, and they've been proliferating even more in the following years. So that brings us to the topic of the Relion Med project. The scientific coordinator from the Marine and Environmental Research Lab is Dr. Dimitris Klitu. Dimitri, thanks for joining us. This is a problem, I think, that has been growing despite every effort to try and control these fish. Can you just put people who don't know the history in the picture as to where they came from? Because it's probably, what, six or seven years that they've been noticed here, but they are getting worse, aren't they? Yeah, the lionfish came from the Suez Canal. It's 
Uh, some of them have the tendency to become invasive, which means to outcompete local species and cause ecological disasters and even socioeconomic uh, impacts. Lionfish is uh, one of the most invasive fish in the Eastern Mediterranean. It came, like you said, in Cyprus. It first made its first uh, sightings were in 2012-2013 period. And since then, there was a short delay, few sightings for a few years, and then since 2015-16, they became very common. And for the last uh, three years, we've been doing a relarming project, and we are making efforts to control it. But we understand that this is a battle that is not easy to control because the lionfish is widely spread now. It has expanded in the Eastern Mediterranean, also in the Aegean, in the Ionian Sea. It has reached the coast of Tunisia and Malta, so it, it's spreading quickly. It's everywhere. So this is it requires international collaboration and efforts, and you cannot control it on, on a larger scale, but you can control it on a local scale. So this is our focus, is to develop the mechanisms the tools and the removers to train divers to remove it properly and also to create incentives and open up the market for these fish. So we're working closely with restaurants and also jewelry makers to create a market for it. By creating a market, we create an incentive to uh, remove this fish. I wouldn't say we're doing all these uh, uh, very big efforts because we're just a few divers doing some removals. It needs much more big a number of removers in all Mediterranean countries. So I'm not agreeing with you that uh, we're doing all these uh, big efforts. I, I think there's much more ground to do much more. Uh, we're just focusing our removal efforts in a few areas where uh, they are marine protected areas or natura sites. They have some significant ecological significance, but... Um, uh, outside these uh, areas that we don't do removal, the lionfish are, are taking over and, and, and becoming more abundant and they will keep coming in. So the only way to control it is to increase its fishing pressure. And that's what work, worked well in most cases in the Caribbean and that's what we're trying to replicate here. But uh, we, we're also developing the infrastructure through this project. Many the tools, like uh, how to properly remove it, the removing toolkit, the sighting, uh, MedMeet application, which you can upload your sighting so we know where they concentrate. We're working closely with the policy makers. We're trying to get special permits to, to divers to remove it so that there's going to be more removals. Now we have a special permit to bypass the law, basically, because no scuba divers can hold the spear gun, but with this special permit, we can. So it's a long process. We did a risk assessment, for example, for the European Union to uh, include these species in the invasive alien species list of the EU. And when that happens, when it invades another, another country, it's currently being reviewed and evaluated by the EU, the risk assessment. But if it gets approved, then all member states, uh, they need to take some measures against it. Uh, so that will be, yeah, they don't have to delay like we did here in Cyprus uh, to prove that it's invasive because we know, we know it's going to become invasive, so we need to react quickly. It's yeah. fascinating stuff, but it's also a very dangerous fish, isn't it? So I'm wondering what happens, for example, you've trained divers on how uh -huh. to deal with this fish, and I think it's poisonous, so it's got to be prepared a particular way yeah. if it's to be eaten, and you're training chefs to do that. But I'm wondering what happens to our local fishermen if they find these in their nets, because have they yeah. been trained okay. on how to handle yeah. them? Well, they, they already know by now because it's, it's becoming a common catch. And there's many, many, many cases of people being stung by their venomous spine. There's no reason to panic. I mean, it's not the first, not the last species in the, in the marine waters that has uh, some kind of uh, toxic venom. This one has, but many others have as well. Like the rabbit fish has some venom, the puffer fish has a much more serious venom that can actually poison people after eating it. In this case, it doesn't work with the lionfish. The venom is just the tip of the hard spine. If you remove the spine, it's completely safe, it's a delicious place. So 
So you just need to show the chef and the household how to cut those venomous spines very easy with a scissor. And then it's completely safe to handle and, and it's very highly nutritious. This venom is nothing if it gets done by accident. It's like just a bit of pain. It's like a bee sting. So it's just like exactly in a bee sting. Some people may react uh, allergically to it and may have an anaphylactic shock. The same thing can happen. Like a small percentage of people being stung by the lionfish may have this allergic reaction to it. But it's like a very tiny percentage. The only thing you can do to mitigate the pain and it goes away relatively quickly is to warm up the area of uh, injury to put your hand, for example, under hot water or if you have a heat pack, uh, generate some heat and the heat basically denatures this protein, which is the venom, is the protein. Even if you cook it with the spine, the, this protein will be cooked, will be denatured and it's completely safe. Even if you cook them, the fish with the spines, it's completely safe to, to consume. And to right. Handle. Can I also ask you, I mean, we rely so much on nature to deal with its own problems. Yeah, and okay, although well. the timeline, obviously, is much longer, there surely must be somewhere down the line the idea yeah, that nature will bring a predator for this fish so that the ecosystem maintains a sort of balance. Is that a silly thing to ask you? Well, it's a problem that invasive um, biological control is the number one option, of course, but it's not feasible in this case because, first of all, it's venomous spines protected from predation, unless most predators. The local predators here are not adapted to eat lionfish, so they don't recognize it as a potential prey. Although they could eat it, maybe they don't try to because they don't recognize it. They didn't evolve with it. But uh, nevertheless, uh, there is evidence that uh, groupers, they predate on lionfish. And we have evidence from spearfishers and fishermen finding lionfish in the stomachs of groupers. The only problem is that these potential predators that may control the lionfish, may predate on it, they are overfished in the Mediterranean. So we can rely on them because they're overfished. They cannot predate on the lionfish. The lionfish numbers increase exponentially because it's a, it's a generalist species. It adapts relatively easily to any environment. It feeds on everything and it reproduces crazy quickly. It produces millions of eggs every year. And uh, the big predators like groupers, that they reproduce very slowly. Uh, the lionfish within a year reaches reach sexual maturity, starts reproducing. The groupers need a few years to do that. And they're being overfished as well. Anyways, the numbers of lionfish are too high for, for biological control to be effective. Where did the lionfish come from and why? I mean, is it because the Mediterranean's got warmer? It came, as I said, from the, the Indo-Pacific origin. It came through the, uh, from the Red Sea through the Suez Canal. Uh, genetic analysis show that it's actually uh, a founding population that came in through the through the Swift Canal. Dimitri, can I ask you, did they come here because, for example, the Mediterranean got warmer? I mean, what attracted them well, to come that, here? That, thank you for guiding the discussion of things that I would like to mention. It's true that uh, with global warming, uh, we have a terminology we use, uh, tropicalization of the Mediterranean Sea, that uh, as it gets warmer, these tropical species that are coming from the Red Sea are gaining uh, an advantage over the local ones. So, yeah, global warming is, uh, in fact, accelerating these invasions because they are tropical species, They're the ones that are coming through the Suez Canal. So they benefit and, and they have a, an advantage, competitive advantage. So finally, tell me a little bit about this app that's been developed that I think divers, uh, presumably yeah. divers, but also swimmers who probably swim straight in the opposite exactly. direction if they see one, can at least upload where they've seen these fish so you know where to dispatch your diving teams. That's a concept, yes. So it's basically an app, um, also on Apple and Android. It's called IUCN MedMe. 
It's an app for uh, many marine invasive species, but it has a special app online for the lionfish, a special portal. A user can find useful information on there uh, about other invasive species as well, but they can easily upload a sighting. Like you said, it could be any user of the sea, not just a fisherman or a diver, but a swimmer or a recreational. And when they do, we get this uh, notification and they need to upload the geographic uh, location as well. And we have to validate the sighting, so we need some kind of proof, evidence, photograph, and so on. And then we can coordinate the removal actions so that they take place in areas where the lionfish concentrate in, in those hot spots. So currently we work with over 100 divers that are included in these uh, action teams. We call them removal action teams. So there's over 100 divers, and we do removals like uh, at least twice a month from areas where the lionfish aggregate. And marine protected areas is the focus, artificial reefs, the area of Cabo Greco, which is highly infested in lionfish and is very important locally for its um, ecosystem value. So we're trying through these uh, teams, the app, and also the market approach, and there's also another work package with the policy. We're doing some uh, tools for the management guide, model tools that will, uh, will be applied by managers that will help the managers deal with the problem once the project is, is gone. But uh, we want the EU, basically, and the Mediterranean countries to to make special permits for divers to remove them because it's been the most effective way to remove the lionfish. So there's also other ways like underwater uh, AUVs and robots and, and also other types of fishing and traps are now being explored, whether we can use traps to, to collect them. But all these other types of fishing, the some of them are, are non-selective. While doing this with the slingshot and the, the special... Uh, removal toolkit that we made for the project. It's very highly selective method. You just remove the lion fish and it's very highly effective as well. Well, um, it's something that I think is going to be going on for years and years by the sound of it, at the rate that they are sort of reproducing. I know that you have a website, ReLionMed, R-E-L-I-O-N-M-E-D, and if people look for that, you've got all the details there, and I see a link for where people can download the app. So thank you so much for joining us and bringing us up to date on something that is not always a very well documented problem. Most of us have heard about it and then just think it's gone away, but it's not going away anytime soon, I think. No, so we better adapt to it. <laughs> well, um, you're certainly doing that, and I presume that there are links as well if divers or yeah, swimmers want to course. get in touch. Get in touch with me and uh, rely on my team, and I'm sure we will embrace the efforts. All of these divers are volunteering, eh? it's, it's amazing how much people care if you really show the problem to them. And it's really motivated by this uh, group of divers and the fishermen that are engaging with us in the project. And this is very nice to see. And I hope it expands more to other countries. And they learn from this and they also start removing the lionfish because I see the same story being repeated now in Greece, in Italy where you see a few lionfish, but not too many. Uh, but if they don't react now, it's going to be too late for them. So it's time to react and work together with the communities and the divers and adapt, create some markets for the lionfish so that uh, they will all benefit from this. It could be our new Christmas dinner, who knows? Dr. Dimitris Klitu from the Marine and Environmental Research Lab telling us there about the project to control the lionfish population in the Mediterranean and do check their website, relyonmed.eu. Well, that's about it for this week. And, of course, Christmas is just around the corner, followed by the New Year celebrations. So I'll be away for a couple of weeks, but just let me say I hope you have a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. We'll meet again in a couple of weeks. Until then, take care and God bless. Bye-bye now.